Formation of the Earth. Outgassing of molecules. Formation of oceans. rocks. Prokaryotic cell organisms. Photosynthesis. Photosynthesis by blue-green algae. Eukaryotic cell organisms. Last band of ion formation. Rise of multicellular organisms. Cambrian expansion of waxy coated algae begins to form in the roots. Our minds and our hearts are both sacred. Faith and science, doubt and belief serve the pursuit of truth. Join us for Evolving Universe, Evolving Faith, a Darkwood Brew series produced in collaboration with the Adler Planetarium in Chicago and the Clergy Letter Project. We're exploring how current scientific theories on creation and the evolution of the universe, quantum theory, and the human body itself reawaken our spiritual imagination more robustly than any time since the Enlightenment. Please join us on this exciting journey. Boy, after that opening video, 49 years old just seems like a blink of an eye. I don't feel so old anymore. <laughs> Hi, welcome to Darkwood Brew, where ancient Christian mystical practice meets modern interactive web technology, world-class jazz, arts, biblical scholarship, and well, you never know exactly what's going to happen. So what does a rock star and an astrophysics geek slash theologian, what do, they, what do these two people have in common? They're both guests tonight at Darkwood Brew. Leah Schweitz is uh, an associate professor of, systematic, of theology at Luther School of Theology and also the director of the Zygon Center for Faith and Science. And Namely Brennett, well, a rock star from Tucson, Arizona. I'll let you decide which one is which in that, in that picture. But uh, along the way, we'll be uh, asking the question in this uh, series, exploring uh, evolution and faith, what's love got to do with it, as well as human suffering and doubt? But before we go any further in our episode, uh, let's take a look at what hap what's happened so far in our series. What is the most astounding fact you can share with us about the universe? The most astounding fact is the knowledge that the atoms that comprise life on Earth, the atoms that make up the human body, are traceable to the crucibles that cooked light elements into heavy elements in their core. As we explore more and more and we learn more and more in science, um, we see that far from taking away the mystery, we deepen the mystery. I think you start out with this idea of what it's going to be like. And then when you do finally look at the Earth for the first time, you're overwhelmed by how much more beautiful it really is when you see it for real. God wants us to use our gifts to to bring the best that we have and our, our own melodies in and God improvises with those and weaves it all together into the most beautiful music. To the degree that each of us incarnates that, that seed of divinity, that seed of commitment to living in integrity and being of service to the future and to the, to the well-being of the larger body of life, we actually participate in the second coming of Christ. Has your, uh, the expansion of scientific knowledge for you made God smaller? Absolutely not. Um, it makes the whole thing more awesome. And I would personally welcome the discovery of, you know, cosmic brothers and sisters out there, so to speak. Um, and I wouldn't want to place any assumptions on how God may relate to them. You have anointed me and given me strength. My eyes can see, my ears can hear. I'll be strong like the trees on Lebanon and cherish in the gods of love. It is good, it is good to give thanks to the Lord. It is good to give praise to the Lord Most High. To proclaim your love in the morning and your faithfulness in the night. Let's give thanks to the Lord. 
Now I'm feeling about 200 million years old. <laughs> that was a, yeah, quite a lot of evolution there. So, uh, Well, Anomaly, it's great to have uh, you with us from, from Tucson, Arizona, too. You were here last fall when I was down under, I think, in Australia. And yeah. uh, so I missed seeing you live here in the coffee house. But welcome again. Thanks. Now, so what brings you to these parts? Besides my love for the city of Omaha. That's right, <laughs> and Darkwood Brew, yes. <laughs> Well, that was good. That was crowd pleaser. Uh, uh, you know, I'm just on a kind of a never-ending tour. And, uh, you know, I came in from uh, Denver, Kansas. And uh, I, I really do like stopping here. Yeah. So, and I really love being a part of this show. So. Cool. You and Bob Dylan on the uh, never-ending tour. So, yeah. Yeah, great. I think he makes a little more money than I do, but I could be <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yes, but, but Bob Dylan probably would never write songs specifically for Darkwood Brew, and you That's did that right. last time you were That's here. True. You wrote that song of Babylon, which was amazing. Nice. It really created a lot of buzz. So look forward to hearing you a couple times, about maybe even three times during this, this uh, broadcast. So welcome again. Yes. So we've been uh, looking at the blogs uh, this week, and boy, I'm telling you, if you haven't been out to the Darkwood Brew blog, um, I would definitely get out there. You, you talk about some really great digestion of what's been going on with these amazing guests we keep having. Uh, and uh, this last week was no exception. We had a lot of great conversation, including uh, from our uh, guest blogger, Marianne Fulkert. And she posted an interesting comment that sparked our question of the week. Um, Marianne was reflecting on uh, Michael Dowd's visit last week, uh, who uh, asserts a, a theology of called Christian naturalism. And uh, Marianne writes, uh, if, da if, as Dowd suggests, the only way for us to know God is through scientific, historical, and cross-cultural evidence, uh, then it is impossible to be in relationship with God. In that case, the best one can hope for is to learn about God and God's creation. This might inspire one to live with greater integrity, as Dowd suggests, uh, but it doesn't have the same transforming, sustaining, uplifting, and upholding power as God's active presence in one's life. At first glance, Dowd's message appears to be one that unites science and spirituality, but really it's just an inspiring spin on science. Well, that was a provocative uh, statement. We decided to let's um, let's throw it out there to uh, our our Darkwood Brew community, and that inspired the question of the week. Yeah, the question of the week was: Is it possible to have a personal relationship with God? What makes you say that? And the three that we picked out for our slides tonight were from Scott Elness. He says, "I'm not sure it's possible not to. Where is God not? Whether we like it or not, we are in constant personal relationship with God." Oops. Just a second. I'm sorry. I'm just messing with the slides here, trying to find. There he is. That 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 person does bear relationship to uh, the host of Darkwood Brew. Now we need to go forward. Sorry. Uh, okay. There Next we go. That's one. that. Okay. Sorry. One more. I'm lost. I'll have to let Marine the Matthews. <laughs> oh, Marine. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Answers the next one. I struggle with this because the image of God in personal relationship sounds anthropomorphic. Language falls short in capturing my relationship to God that transcends time and space. And Robert Hurst answers, my answer is yes. What often stands in the way is me. Mm. Yeah. So there was lots of question I think out there. Um, there were 15 or 16 comments that that question that the use of the word personal relationship, you know, yeah. whether you could actually have a personal relationship, whether God was, you're personifying God and making God a thing rather than um, the, the creator and the essence of all being. Yeah. yeah so there true. was lots of discussion about that. That uh, should be a good, I think, fodder for more blogs next week. Even. Yeah. Well, you know, and, and I think that's a question we all wrestle with if we're thinking uh, people of, of faith is that the anthropomorphization anthropomorphization of God. I don't even know if that's, that's a word. That's why I use but, personification. Uh, <laughs> that's right. Uh, but, you know, uh, given that we all thinking people know that God isn't a person. In fact, I don't, I've never actually met a person of faith who thinks that God is an actual person. Right. But, um, you know, it's something we all wrestle with. But I, I guess the question I have is how, um, 
how could we not have uh, a relationship with God that wouldn't be personified? You know, I think about, for instance, um, my dog, Kida. I've got actually a photograph of Kida that I'll uh, put up there. Uh, she actually died uh, about this time last year. Uh, she uh, was our Doberman for, she died at the age of 10. She, uh, the last couple of years of her life, she had developed uh, diabetes, which led to uh, cataracts and blindness, and then she finally died of cancer. So a great, vigorous dog for most of her life. But um, if, if Kita were to, um, you know, if, if I were kind of by analogy God and Kita were a human being, you know, um, if we're going to try to work on that analogy, if Kita were to describe her relationship with me um, as a human being, uh, she would, or now as God, um, you know, she would describe that relationship in terms that if I, you know, looking at her, listening to her, speak, so to speak, I would probably disagree with her characterization of, of what I'm like, because she'd be thinking through in, in dog terms. And also, her world, if she were to describe her world like the last two years of her life, she'd probably say the world grew dark when it was just her cataracts, and she would say that the world grew dry because her diabetes led her to be get thirsty. thirsty. Now, uh, she would be, you could say she was 100% wrong about the cause of all these things, or she could be 100% wrong about what I'm actually, you know, who I actually am in my human identity, or now God identity. Um, and yet she would be, her experience of me and the world would be 100% real. Hmm. And I think that when we have a relationship, we talk about a relationship with God, it's kind of like a dog saying, I have a relationship with you know, a master or a human being. Um, we are probably about 100% wrong about you know, trying to describe the inner workings of that relationship, but it doesn't mean we can't be a, even 100% right about our actual experience of that transcendent being. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, kind of once I started thinking about those things, I, I, I lost my, my fear of personifying God too much, as long as you realize that you don't have the whole explanation. It's like, well, how, you know, how would a dog describe their relationship with a human being outside of dog terms? You know, I can't describe my relationship with God outside of... Well, that's why I liked um, Mary Ann's description that there are two different ways of knowing God. It's the reality, integrity, uh, very tangible things that Michael Dowd talked about last week, as well as that inner intuitive kind of feeling that you can't justify, it's just there. Yeah. Um, so those kinds of things are what poets call, you know, just feeling around the edges in the fringes of life and never really knowing the full picture of things. So. Right. And we're going to be exploring that, that fringe a bit more fully uh, with Dr. Leah Schweitz uh, when she comes on uh, and also kind of exploring how, you know, the relationship, relationship between faith and science isn't always an easy one and nor should it be. Right. Uh, so uh, we'll be going, coming to uh, Leah in a few moments. But first we want to turn uh, to our NUMA reading. Tracy Halverson is on break this week, so Chris will be uh, taking uh, that reading. We're going to be reading, actually, from the book of Luke, chapter 6, uh, a portion of the Sermon on the Mount by Jesus, uh, chapter, uh, verses 26 through 37. Uh, and uh, let's just simply listen to that passage. If you're just joining us for the first time, we hear it once, and then you'll see it on the screen uh, once. And uh, we're going to ask you, if you're on live chat, to simply indicate which verse kind of lifts itself off the screen for you, or you, that you remember that strikes uh, your your energy. Um, there's a button on the on the chat screen to push to indicate your verse, and we'll be calling for that verse from the coffee house. And whatever kind of the world community decides upon, uh, we'll also uh, then comment on that particular verse later in our program. Uh, and just before we get to that, also we want to thank you um, again. We've been getting some donations this week too for the continuance of our program, and we really, really sincerely appreciate that when that happens. Uh, we have a matching grant right now, so every donation is doubled. Uh, and so uh, thank you for, um, for your support of Darkwood Brew. Now let's listen to Luke chapter 6, verses 27 through 36. But I say to you that listen, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you, if anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Give to everyone who begs from you. And if anyone takes away your goods, do not ask for them again. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, 
what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you hope to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love your enemies, do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. Your reward will be great and you will be children of the Most High. For he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. What was the verse that resonated for you? We invite you to uh, indicate that on, on the live chat and in the coffee house. We invite you to write that on your sheet. And we invite you to simply hold that verse, whatever that was, uh, with you. Uh, consider particularly, uh, is there an issue that you're struggling with um, this week um, where perhaps this line uh, may be speaking to that particular issue? Let's uh, hold these things close as we uh, hear from Nomaly Brennan. Let me uh, introduce the fellows in the band real quick. Ron Cooley on the guitar, Bob Bennett on the drums, Ricky Williams on the bass. Uh, we're going to do some Anomaly Brennett material. This uh, first one, well, the last one that we we'll end up doing is called Life, Life Breath Sound. The middle one is Settle Down, and this one is called Stars. Anomaly Brennett. B. 
Maybe this world is just thinner than it seems. Maybe we're all partners in the same lucid dream. Yeah, well, maybe we're vapors. Maybe we're just steam. Maybe we're creatures of habit and malice that pale in the light of the aurora borealis. And what if we, what if we are? What if we, what if we are only? Stars. Only stars. In the dark. Just a spark Maybe we're just lucky and blessed to bear witness to the flashing of this meteor, the tail of this comet. Maybe we're cursed, maybe we're fortunate. Maybe we just go on a milky white way. Maybe we get to stay. And what if we, what if we are? What if we, what if we Thanks, Donnelly. It's great. Well, we're very pleased to be joined now by Dr. Leah Schweitz, who is joining us from uh, the cold city of Chicago now. <laughs> Leah, it's good to have you on. Yeah, it's great to be here. Thanks so much. Oh, can I? I? Oh, just a second. We can't hear you in the coffee house here. Can you we get the volume up in the coffee house? All right. Hello. Hello. Oh, there we go. Now I can hear you. <laughs> Loud and clear. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for uh, joining us this evening. We've been looking forward to this very much. Yeah, likewise. Oh, it's a delight to be here. It's a great conversation. I'm really happy to be a part of it. Thanks. So you you essentially uh, wear two hats. You are a professor at Luther School of Theology and also with the Zygon Center. What can you tell us about those hats? Um, the, the, I'm lucky to wear both of them. <laughs> um, so at the Lutheran School of Theology, uh, we have uh, sort of a range of graduate programs training folks entering uh, congregations after here, uh, MDiv students who are entering congregations, academic programs, and a, a global PhD program. So we're really blessed um, to serve and um, be served by students from around the world um, doing academic study here at the Lutheran School. Um, uh, the Zygon Center is um, uh, a piece of the... Uh, uh, the offerings at uh, the Lutheran School, uh, the Zygon Center brings together scientists and philosophers, ethicists, scholars for just exactly this kind of conversation, really constructive, um, engaging, critical kinds of conversations. Um, I think one of the marks of the Zygon Center, the way that we do that conversation is by bringing scientists in and really letting them have the floor sort of to speak from the work that they do, bring really cutting, cutting edge science to us um, in the faith communities that, um, that gather here. Uh, it's really exciting. Uh, we, have one of, um, we have a program coming up uh, in two weeks, actually, on March 15th, that exemplifies that. Um, we've got Ron Numbers, um, Grace Wolf Chase, um, who's been on this series as well, and Tom, Thomas Ord uh, coming to join us for 
uh, a great afternoon conversation of just just this sort of thing. Um, so that's that's really what we're about there, uh, sort of bringing this conversation to our students um, as they go into congregations and parishes uh, and to the public at large here in Chicago. That's great. So last week, our guest, uh, Michael Dowd, uh, had reflected on kind of the autism we have in church with respect to science, uh, the, the conversation between faith and science. It sounds like Lutheran School of Theology is really um, uh, kind of on the cutting edge of, of, of overcoming that autism. With yeah, I'm a little Center. nervous about putting it that way for lots of reasons, but yeah, I really think that um, this conversation is so important. Um, it's so important for how we read the Bible, for how we live faithful lives, and really for how it is that we have healthy congregations. I think that this um, uh, really hearing from scientists in these ways uh, can really sort of speak to and help us grow our faith. And keep our kids, keep our kids in church, too. I really think, you know, there's um, studies that have come out that shows it's one of the reasons that, that we lose kids at early ages, and I think we just... It's, it's important to um, have this be a really healthy, full, rich conversation. Yeah, that's really true. It's had an effect here at Countryside Church because we uh, we actually follow uh, the Darkwood Brew series and the Countryside Community Church series uh, parallel each other. So we've been I've been preaching on Sunday mornings on the same or uh, similar uh, subjects, and um, we have been flooded with comments from our youth actually, uh, who are like, "Wow, <laughs> this is really yeah, amazing." It's really okay to think these things and have these questions and that sort of thing to really, you know, have Sunday morning be a place that the you come in and out of rather than it stays there. So you bring your questions that uh, the rest of the week, you know, the rest of the week uh, brings up in you and you take them out and live them in the world. I think that kind of traction between what happens there and um, other places is so important. You know, our lives are filled technologically and scientifically saturated. Uh, and so to think that we have to leave that at the doors, uh, I think that that's, um, that won't serve us well in the long run. Yeah. So how, how, does the, uh, how does faith and science come together in your own personal path? Um, well, let's see. Uh, it depends how far back I should start that uh, that question. But, um, you know, for me, I was one of those kids that uh, when I came home from school, uh, after a long day at school, uh, my dad, he never asked me what I learned at school. He would always ask me if I had asked any good questions. Mm. Um, and that was true, whether it was Sunday school or high school. <laughs> um, so for her, you know, it was really about asking good questions. And um, to my mind, that's so key for what it is that the faith and science conversation can do, um, is really sort of be a home for those those questions. Um, you know, I really engaged religion and science for the first time intentionally um, in a college. I was at Luther College. I was a biology uh, entomology, in fact. So I was working on ground ground beetles and um, tall grass prairie ecology while I was there. And so I would have these glorious days spent in tall grass prairies in Iowa, right? What you usually think of when you hear Iowa, but um, tall grass prairies in Iowa uh, and would bring back pitfall traps with ground beetles and bugs and things. But I would have this day to think about the nature of evidence and belief and how belief and evidence came together, uh, what, what we needed to see in order to know. And I would bring those questions back with me to the lab. Um, my science professors rightly suggested I take those questions elsewhere <laughs> and <laughs> count the beetles, right? So to do the work of science, but take those questions elsewhere. Um, you know, and that really could have been one of those spaces where... Um, the incompatibility or the conflict between religion and science might have manifested, but they didn't say, you know, go away. They said, just take them elsewhere and come back. Hmm. Uh, and so it was really, you know, it was really the first, um, the first sense about how in a whole life, the questions and the searching and the evidence, all of those things kind of come together. Um, that asking those questions was, was compatible with living a full faithful life. Yeah, yeah. So I, I want to get to kind of uh, some of those areas where science and faith um, exist in perhaps a disjunctive relationship, or uh, you know, uh, at, and and how that may be helpful. But but before we we, we go there, um, perhaps you could you could kind of um, reflect a bit on on where you find uh, science and faith really existing in a harmonious uh, relationship. Yeah, I think one of the things that I think has been so lovely about the series so far is that we've seen it um, in several folks from a, a variety of different um, voices, too, uh, that, you know, faith and science really, I think, can come together to show the magnitude, immensity, robustness, richness um, uh, of God and God's creation. Uh, so I think in all of those ways, I, I was um, making notes about some of the, right, it deepens the mystery. Um, it, it sort of gives us this overwhelmingness of beauty and interconnectedness. Um, all of these ways, I think, are really are really wonderful. Um, and I actually, you know, I think that uh, there, there fundamentally is a really deep compatibility between science and um, 
and uh, faith. You know, for me as a uh, sort of ecolo uh, ecologist, I think in systems and the interconnectedness that we see throughout, uh, throughout ecology now, throughout the dependencies and evolution, I think that those interconnectedness, those levels of interconnectedness really support kind of the vision that God has um, for how we ought to relate with one another, that there's this deep dependency and interrelationship between us, our, the creation and God. Uh, and so that's, that's another place for me that I really see those sort of deep, deep connections between um, faith and science. Yeah, yeah I, I hear you there. You know, I, I was struck, uh, you know, as I was, my doctorate was in the Old Testament and, and, uh, and going back and digging around Genesis 1, for instance, and, and, and just hearing how those ancient peoples were reflecting on the interrelationships of, of creation and, and not with an idea of creating a scientific treatise about you know, history, but, but even then in that, that those early times being so vitally aware of how an ecosystem, I mean, Genesis 1 is really about an ecosystem of interdependent relationships that are existing in these mutually fruitful relationships with each other. And uh, and just how deep that that intuition was, and then to in our modern era have uh, science, you know, showing similar, in, you know, reflecting the similar in intuition that just seemed to come together. It's like pouring gasoline on fire, you know, <laughs> in, in a certain respect. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, I think that's I think that's right, you know, and I think that the the beauty of some of those is the way in which there's so many layers of interconnectedness there too. You know, it, it happens on so many different kinds of planes um, that the the really the richness and complexity of it comes I think comes through really really wonderfully. Yeah, so where where do you find uh, science and religion um, perhaps having having some issues or or not quite an easy match? Yeah, uh, the video actually that we the, that started the uh, episode tonight, I think, starts to push on one of those places where um, it's really a challenge. You know, some of my own work works on um, theological anthropology, which is just a fancy way to say, right, the relationship between God and humans. Um, so I'm really interested in this relationship between God and humans. And uh, if you look at it on one hand, that relationship looks like human beings are really this remarkably special, privileged creature. Uh, but if you look at it sort of from the perspective, even of the, I mean, I've had forgotten about that wonderful Simpsons episode, but uh, <laughs> in both of those, right, you really see humanity is really just a blip. Just, you know, we're latecomers on the scene. Uh, we haven't been here very long. Uh, uh, we're enmeshed in all of these interconnections. And so I think this is really one of those places where um, faith and science have, have there's, there's, there's conflicts in the readings that can come up there. There's sort of this this urge to have um, a really unique, special place for humanity. And at the same time, science tells us that we have this history that we share. We're, we're new, we're small, um, both of those. So I think that can be, you know, the, the, um, the special creation story of Adam and Eve, I think, can really push in both of these directions, right? You get this sense that um, they, were, they were really made out of something special. And uh, maybe that's not really the, the first best way that we should, uh, you know, really come to that text. Um, it maybe has something more to tell us about the the kind of ways in which we're interconnected, and we end up in systems that are already always right working for the powerful and the oppressed, um, so that that we have this sense of original sin that we are you know born into from the very beginning, and that's not what God intends. And I think that there's there's ways to really work out these kinds of conflicts. I think there is this kind of compatibility, but um, there's more to be said here. But the that's one of those spaces that I think that text and some of those tendencies is one of the places of real deep conflict. Yeah. So the Genesis text would suggest that we are kind of born into something that's uh, so quite wonderful and extraordinary, but also something that's that's broken, a, a system, as you say, that that's broken, whereas science would suggest that um, what there's more, more uh, something more har harmonious uh, going on or... I don't think that science is going to tell us something um, much more harmonious, but I think it's going to sort of put us put us in our place in a way, right? <laughs> uh, it's going to it's going to say that uh, well, you, you didn't just sort of emerge out of uh, uh, out of nothing. It's not. It's going to say that you you you're dependent on all of these features of the natural history in order to have come about. Um, so it's going to be. I think the picture looks much more much more like that. It sort of puts us in. Um, embeds us, really embeds us in a, a natural order. Um, and if you focus on the, the creation aspect of that, that story with Adam and Eve, I think that that, that, that pushes against the, the natural history reading. Um, mm. Does that make sense? 
Yeah, yeah. I was just trying to think though. Uh, Adam uh, being created out of out of mud. You know. That, that <laughs> now Eve was seems like humanity 2.0. She you know got the rib right. No, there was there's something special. But Adam just got dirt. You know. <laughs> Yeah, we don't usually lean on that part of it, though. Uh, you know, no. in some of my conversations, that's that's really the space where folks. Um, it's not so much the the change over long periods. It's really it's really the deeply, deeply connected to the the rest of the the rest of the natural order and the way in which you know uh, it's it's uh, it's it's not literally sort of a, a a blowing into the humanity to create something unique at that moment. So I right. think. I mean, I really think that that's the that's one of those places that this, these these two these two um, the faith and science conversation has has had some um, uh, real conflict. Right. So if we're going to look at Genesis and try to uh, impose upon it a, a view of like uh, how things came to be, uh, we're probably going to run into tr trouble with, with science. Uh, may, and uh, maybe it's it's Genesis is going about more about uh, the why things came to be or. Uh, the relationship we have between ourselves and God and, and, the, and the planet. Right, exactly. You know, there's, there's deep truth to be had there. There's deep truth to be had there about how it is that we are really always and already born into systems that, you know, serve the powerful um, and oppress the poor and the weak. I think, you know, there's, there's, something, there's something true about original sin in that sense, that we've, from the minute we're born, we're born into these systems that, that, that serve that serve the powerful and oppress the weak and poor. Um, I think that that, and, you know, that, that story also tells us that it's not what God intends. So we get these two pieces that I think are absolutely truthful out of, out of that story. But if we, if we fall onto uh, using that to tell us something about how it came to be, that's the, the conflict that I, that we get there. I think um, uh, it need not be, but it is a space of genuine conflict. I think it, right. it causes people to doubt and worry in ways that um, I don't think we do well. We don't, the religious folks don't talk well or enough about doubt, I think, about doubt and how there's really uh, the faithful life has to have space for those questions, right? That, that the faithful life, you know, too often I think that doubt and uncertainty is sort of the exit ramp out of a faithful life. Um, and if we were to do, you know, do a little bit better about talking about weaving that into a fully faithful life, um, I think that would help. That would help us. Yeah. Well, we want to develop that further and ask you about the, the problem of evil, uh, too, in the world. <laughs> When we when we come back uh, to you in a in a few minutes, but uh, thank you for joining us thus far. We'll look forward to uh, to continuing that that conversation. Great, sounds good. Thanks. Uh, and at this time, we it, uh, we want to check about that Numa uh, reading uh, in the coffee house. If you'll hold up your uh, Numa sheets, and uh, we'll get a reading on, on where the coffee house coming in. And then Morris, if you've got a reading from the internet here, so you've got from a lot the of internet verse thirty five. Yeah, I'm seeing a lot of 35s here, too, as well as 36s and various verses in the 20s. But it looks like the Internet and, and the coffee house are pretty much in agreement on 30, verse 35 here, uh, striking the most energy. Um, not that there are any winners to this <laughs> at all, but simply uh, something that, it that seems to have joined us uh, at this particular point. Uh, but love your enemies, do good, and lend, expecting nothing in return. Your reward will be great and you will be children of the Most High, for God is good to the grateful and the wicked. Um, we're going to, uh, uh, we'll invite uh, uh, Professor uh, Schweitz to comment on that verse, if she would care to, too, and we'll kind of explore how this plays into the whole uh, faith and evolution and science uh, question. Uh, but before we do that, uh, let's hear again from Namely Brennan. Water line. 
Like angels whose feet never touch the ground How could they ever know How their green words could still resound So long after they go Sister Rosie wasn't born to settle If you, if you enjoy uh, Anomaly's music live, you may be interested to know that she has a live CD that was released just uh, last year called Anomaly Brennett Live. And you could find that and other uh, music as well as a, a tour schedule at uh, anomalybrennett.com. I'll note that the, uh, the little call out that was put up uh, had a misspelling of her name. It's N N A M A O L I B R E N N E T. Right? That sounds right. Yeah. Something, something close that. to that, anyway. <laughs> anyway, I uh, encourage you to, to check out her, her website and her tour, tour schedule. Well, uh, we uh, want to bring back Leah Schweitz again and uh, continue the, the conversation. So, uh, Leah, we, uh, uh, the, the, the verse that came out on the, on the NUMA reading uh, was this one uh, But love your enemies, do good, and lend, expecting nothing in return. Your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, for God is good to the grateful, ungrateful and the wicked. Uh, does that verse uh, suggest anything to you with respect to uh, uh, the whole discussion about faith and science uh, in any way? Or uh, I mean, I think it, it suggests a bit about um, how we ought to carry on the conversation. Um, so sort of this uh, uh, you know, openness Right, openness and a, a posture of, of love, love and giving first. Um, I think that that's. Uh, I think that does speak really nicely too. You know, I think it's um, it, the, the the those end the end bit is hard, right? That God is still kind and good to the yes. ungrateful, ungrateful and wicked, and right? Yes, that's yes. A, I think that's a that's a hard word. It's a Lenten word for sure. Right? <laughs> right? It's uh, it's part of this season. I think to hear some of those hard words. Um, for me, it's funny that that those are the. The pieces that came out um, for folks, uh, for me, it was really the frame of the um, that passage that came out. Right, it started with for those that listen, mm -hmm. and it ends with be merciful. Um, and you know, thinking about the faith science conversation for this um, this week, those were really the the two bits, the beginning and the end, that mm -hmm. um, really came out to me. This uh, 
sort of uh, listening and being merciful as part of the 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 way in which that converse, these conversations maybe ought best go. Yeah, yeah, I certainly could use a lot more of that. Uh, <laughs> I I wonder too if you know that that uh, the the idea that God is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked you know might be a word of hope too for many of us, uh, but also <laughs> suggest a, a um, something that science is also uh, kind of reminding us of and sometimes reminds religious people of I think because in, in the world of religion oftentimes there there's this idea that if if you do good God you God will prosper you and if you do bad, then God will you know, curse you or you'll incur God's wrath. And yet uh, Jesus seems to be saying here that actually there is grace that goes out to you regardless of who you are too. And it seems that, that uh, the creation itself would suggest um, a, a level of grace that really comes to all of us. It's all of us, yeah. And, you know, it, it works on both both sides there too, right? I think that that we are all sinners, and at the same time, God's God's mercy and grace extends extends to all of us, um, and that includes right the the beauty that we have in the creation. I think that that's that's spot on, yeah. Yeah, I wonder if if our um, our evolutionary history, you know, given that that the way things evolve, the mechanisms, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, but uh, if the, you know, the, it seems that the mechanism over you know, 200 million years or what have you since we've evolved from these, this primordial protoplasm into full-fledged human beings, the mechanism that has driven that has been a lot of competition that, you know, and mutation, and, you know, death of, of, a, uh, of the species that lost the com competition and the advancement of the species that kind of the survival of the fittest, so to speak. Uh, which everybody likes to talk to that I guess Darwin actually never said, but you know, yeah. kind of this, this <laughs> survival of the fittest. Um, and you know, that's so genetically encoded in us that, that when, we, when we are confronted by someone who's very different from us, whether it be someone of a different color skin or a different religion or a different um, a culture or a different political party, uh, that it triggers within us this deeply encoded instinct for survival that says, survival of the fittest, you know, my, you know, I, I need to um, uh, either defeat this other or at least put them, you subjugate them utterly. And mm -hmm. that in some respects, this, this passage about loving your enemies seems to kind of short circuit that circuitry that's, that's built, you know, kind of encoded within us. Yeah, yeah, it's I, you know it's a curious thing. Um, I think that there is a sense in which that there's a sort of default mode, <laughs> right? A default mode um, uh, that, that that we're sort of wired with in part. Um, you know, there's some conversation too about whether or not uh, competition and whatnot really is is the default, the only default. That there's it seems that there's a strong um, strong tendencies toward altruism and some other things that um, can help promote um, healthy healthy groups really. So I think that 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 too. Uh, you'll have to talk um, with some of your future scientists to get the full details. But, uh, uh, you know, I think even that um, there's there's some hope for us in that even too. But I think that, you know, religion and faith, one of the things that they can really do is is help us move to our better natures. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that's uh, uh, the, all of these uh, listen and be merciful and love your enemies. I think that's that's the, the, the mode out of which we should we should operate. And it doesn't, you know, it doesn't ask you to push push those out to be certain or to push push that those questions and doubts out of the community, right? It really wraps them into a community. Uh, and I think that, that that's the piece that I always get nervous about in faith and science conversations. Once once you've been convinced that there is a convergence and a compatibility, not to let that get too easy and that we really have to live in this sort of messy ambiguity, um, right, which is also a very Lenten word, that we have to live in this, um, uh, the, the questions and the doubts and that's all of that is part of really a full and faithful life. Yeah, you know, that's an interesting point. Uh, you know, when Jesus even says, you love your enemies, he actually doesn't say don't have enemies or don't have <laughs> opponents or people who are opposed to you or that you're opposed to. He just says to love them. And, and you know, perhaps and this, and yeah. even in that statement, there is a, a call not to reduce um, the tensions between us you know, too far or to try to eliminate those, but to bridge those in some yeah. way. Yeah, I think that's right. You know, I think really um, the goal for us, uh, whether it's the faith and science conversation or whether it's um, whether it's within religious communities, uh, is I don't think consensus is necessarily our first best goal. I think some kind of solidarity where we can work together, um, work together for the common good in ways that don't depend on um, yeah getting rid of uh, all of the doubts and questions. Um, I think that that that's really the the healthy way forward. Yeah. So where does the the uh, the problem of evil factor in to all this. In our conversations earlier uh, last last week, kind of lean up this, you you kind of uh, raised that that issue of the problem of evil. 
Yeah, you know, I think if there is one place where doubt and um, uncertainty looms the largest, this is the one, right? I think um, I think that the the problem of evil is the big one, uh, and you know, I don't think that there ultimately is a good answer to it. I mean, I think we have things that we can say about the problem of evil. Um, you know, God doesn't intend it. Uh, that all of these sort of, God doesn't intend evil. I, I don't know if God intends the problem of evil, <laughs> but God doesn't intend evil. It's not a punishment. You know, it's, um, it's, uh, 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 a lot of the evil that happens is a result of us. God is in, in it when it's happening in it with the, our, our suffering, but that's not, Finally, I think an explanation of why there is evil in the first place, you know, and I think I think part of all of this is about re restructuring our the way that we respond to it in part, right, is that it doesn't have to be the thing that turns us away from faith or turns us away from God um, uh, so that it's it's more sort of about uh, restructuring how we how we respond, how we respond to evil um, in those in those places. It's not really an answer, an answer to it. And that's, you know, it's, it wraps into this, um, this call to really have a faithful life include questions and doubt. And so staying in the faithful life doesn't demand having an answer to the problem with evil. Staying in the faith doesn't demand necessarily being comfortable with everything that science tells us first off, right? It really demands working into it, living into it, and trying to um, wrestle with it. Yeah. So maybe the fact that, that religion kind of stems, all religious systems kind of stem on one level from an idea of revelation of some sort, perhaps we've gotten a bit too oriented, like, therefore, we must know all the answers, you know, <laughs> to all these, these terrible questions. And, and yet science kind of reminds us, you know, science is more a field not of, of revelation, but of inquiry, you know, and, yeah. and, and that perhaps we could benefit from having more of a spirit of inquiry rather than simply know-it-all answers to extremely difficult questions like that. Yeah, I actually, I think that's one of the places that science has uh, quite a lot to teach us. Not, you know, the content is great, but the, the mode there, I think that being really open to doubt and challenges and whatnot, I think there's a lot there um, that we could incorporate in um, into the way that a faithful life looks, you know, having that, yeah, kind of community sense of, of asking the good questions and challenging one another in the right ways. Um, I think that really, that really is one of the things that the, the way that science uh, embraces questions as the way to move forward. Um, the, there's the there's a lot for us to take in there. Yeah, no doubt. Well, we want to take a take a, a moment to uh, take a question from the internet too. That we've been uh, those people have been uh, chatting mightily here. And Morris, uh, <laughs> you have a question here you could offer. Uh, I do. Um, I, and I, the question is, the question is, um, it may be more scientific, but h here it is. If we evolved from uh, frogs and monkeys. Why do frogs and monkeys still exist? All right. Have any thoughts on that? Frogs and monkeys? <laughs> <laughs> this is well, a, they, I mean, they're, they're a healthy adaptive system too, right? And so um, survival of the fittest doesn't, uh, and that's uh, maybe not even, I mean, there's probably a reason why it wasn't uh, Darwin's uh, Darwin's. Uh, uh, yeah, a term of choice, right? Um, so it's not as though, um, so that, that means that um, everything before has, has overcome, right? Mm -hmm. It's that lines, lines of creatures have, um, have survived, uh, have found healthy ways to adapt into changeable environments. And so um, they're, they're mutually compatible, right? Uh, uh, the one doesn't necessarily preclude, preclude the other. Right. I wonder if that, that question also kind of dovetails on a question I was asked this morning, actually, a, a, after worship by someone who, who asked, uh, you know, hearing about evolution, does this mean that, that we are simply an accident? You know, uh, you know, if we, you know, there was a frog, there's a monkey, and now there's us, and, you know, <laughs> and uh, how do you, where do you uh, find God in all this? Uh, uh, you know, and I'm ourselves, not... so this relationship between us and God, yeah. you know. Yeah, yeah, I have sort of a, a uh, I think probably a Lutheran uh, extension of uh, sacramental theology in this, right? And so I really see God kind of in, with, and under um, the created order in that. Uh, and so I don't, I, I'm not quite, um, uh, the, the, process is, the, the process is more random, but I'm not quite totally convinced that I want to talk about um, uh, accidental in that. You know, for me, it's much, the way that I, um, the way that I like to, to see it much more is that, uh, God is luring us towards things, right? So that um, we have vocations and calls, and there's things that we're we're meant to do in the world um, that God has has um, sort of, you know, called us to. Um, uh, and 
uh, you know, there's there's some intentionality be- behind that. So uh, it, it, a random process, I, I still think, can be being called um, called by the creator uh, who is in with and under the whole processes of creation. Um, so it's you know it's not quite the religious naturalism um, that we heard from um, from last week. It's really aiming to sort of do this blend of transcendent imminence, right? That there's a, a God that's beyond and a God that's in with and under the created order. Mm. So a little both and is what I'm, uh, I'm trying to hold together in that. Right, that makes, a lot, makes, makes sense. Uh, I, want, I think we have time actually for one more question, if, if you've got one, Morris. No, we don't have any more questions <laughs> oh. from, the, uh, from the Internet at this time. Okay, well, then... <laughs> No, no problem. I've got plenty. <laughs> no, but I wonder if, if perhaps uh, you know, you know, kind of stemming from that last question, our, you know, I have no idea, you know, how, you know, what God's intention or lack of thereof about my physical, you know, how I became a human being, you know, it was or how any of us, us do. But I wonder if there's also um, something that kind of runs parallel uh, to just biological, you know, evolution. I mean, faith and religion. Does is about more than biology, and our physical selves. That there seems to be, and I think indicating in this passage, perhaps um, a key a mechanism behind what might be called the evolution of consciousness. Mm-hmm. You know that that when it comes to consciousness, um, there seems to be a lot of um, uh, uh, th- there is a lot of agency in consciousness. You know, uh, Jesus says you will love your enemy, and it seems that. Um, behind that is this idea that's kind of like evolution in the sense there's a death, but not a physical death, but a death of self um, that says, uh, you know, I'm, gonna, I'm going to die to my ego and my sense that I am the only one and master of the universe and that I'm actually far more connected to the other than um, that it may appear. Mm-hmm. And in, in, in making that rec- recognition and actually loving the one who's very different from us, it opens up a whole other field of view to seeing more than just whatever we're opposed to in that person or that person's opposed to us, but actually seeing that person as a whole person and seeing the awesome wonder uh, of that person as well and being, therefore being influenced by that person and therefore expanding our own inner self, our own consciousness through, um, maybe I'm, did I? No, I mean, I, I, think that's, I think that there is, you know, this sort of, um, uh, uh, multiple layers that um, we want to talk about kind of ad- evolving and adapting to. One of my um, favorite, uh, roughly favorite things that um, William James said, he was asked at one point if he was afraid to die. And he said, well, no, I'm not really afraid to die. But the thing is, I'm just now figuring out how to live. Roughly yeah. like that, right? And so there is something about, um, you know, I'm a teacher at heart, really. And so this uh, this whole sort of transformative process of um, uh, uh, it maybe evolving process with you know what it is that we learn um, over the course of a lifetime and culturally what it is that w- what it is that we learn. Um, I don't know. I think this actually is potentially one of those sites. Uh, if I were you know um, projecting into the future about um, where the next big node of worry uh, conflict for religion and science or faith and science might be, I actually think this consciousness free will space and what we're learning about the brain is going to be one of those other ones and so i think for the, just figuring out ways to start this conversation so that the faithful faithful folks are really on the front end of a conversation to think about what's so important about the agency and consciousness and and what it is uh in there that um you know uh, uh is important for a faithful life i think we could be on the front end of that conversation because what we're learning about the brain and the amazing complexity of it, um, I think that that conversation is one that uh, is potentially the next, uh, maybe not the next evolution creation debate, but something like that. The free will and consciousness conversation, I think, is going to be one that we're having for a while. Yeah, that's very true. And and, and far be it from us to oversimplify that one, uh, too. <laughs> yeah, we won't do free will consciousness and the problem of evil tonight, for sure. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Well, we pre- really appreciate your joining us uh, this evening and uh, helping us kind of work through these these issues, especially uh, seeing that you, you, it's not just simply all about harmony between faith and science, that there really there can be differences, and those differences can be productive, too. Yeah, yeah thanks. Oh, it's been a pleasure. Yeah, really. Thanks so much. And your, your, uh, your event at the Zygon Center, again, is, is just coming right up at Chicago, the 14th? It, uh, it's it? the 15th, uh, March 15th. Yeah, if there are Chicagoland viewers... Uh, 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 around to come join us. Uh, it's an afternoon symposium. Uh, there's a morning with um, some really great graduate students, uh, graduate student papers too. You're welcome to come for any any or all of those those bits. Uh, but starting about three o'clock, we'll have 
uh, Ronald Numbers, who's a historian from the University of Wisconsin, Grace Wolf Chase, who you all know and love, um, and Thomas Ord, who's coming um, from uh, from out west, uh, a theologian coming from out west. Uh, the, this kind of uh, religion and science, past, public, and present. Uh, it'll be a great event. Great. Well, thanks again for joining us, Leah. Yeah. Thank you. My pleasure. Well, we may not be able to uh, resolve uh, you know, the, the, all those tensions between faith and science, and, we may, and, and when it comes to human consciousness, we, uh, you know, there, as Dr. Schweitz indicated, there are a lot of issues to be worked through with respect to human agency and our ability to make, uh, you know, where does consciousness come from, and, and is there simply a material cause, or is, is there a non-material cause, and so forth. But one thing that I think is clear um, in, in this whole thing about consciousness is that regardless of where our consciousness comes from, we do have agency with respect to the, the future. When I think about um, that Numa passage that was chosen tonight, and uh, where Jesus once again reiterating, love your enemies, which you know, is where it started, and then he gives several nuances to that in case you didn't get it right, then he comes back and says, love your enemies. In case you didn't hear me right, love your enemies. You know, we oftentimes, I think, give lip service to that. Uh, we, we think, oh, yeah, he's just so wonderful, and yes, of course we do. But we really have no intention of doing so. If you look at the, the, the political climate in our country, for instance, and sequestration and all that, you think, you know, and which is just a reflection of kind of where we are, maybe a distorted reflection, but yet a reflection of where we all kind of are in this polarization. Um, you know, we kind of think, well, Jesus must be naive. He, you know, he you deep down. I mean, really love our enemies? They'll destroy us if, if, we, if we love our enemies. Yet I wonder, you know, given the political climate that we're experiencing right now in our country, you know, how good is hating our enemies done? You know, what's that done for the political parties? You know, how's that working for us? Or if we look at the earth um, projected out into the future, you know, 100 years, 200 years, as we've evolved better and better, uh, more refined ways of killing each other and democratize the instruments of mass destruction, how naive would Jesus sound in his command, not his suggestion, but his command to love our enemies if, uh, to people in a future generation who may have just gone through World War III, people who may be suffering under a nuclear winter or where the, wor the, the, the world has g gone global warming crazy, um, how naive would Jesus be sound uh, then? One way or the other, we do have choices to make in this life, uh, and we do have agency to make those decisions. Will we love our enemy, or will we hate our enemy? And if we're going to choose the path of hatred, we need to really ask the question, where is that truly taking us? Of course, it's risky to, hate, to love our enemies. Our enemies may not reciprocate. They may not love us in return. But the meal that we share at the end of Darkwood Brew, I think, brings uh, even that together. We, every week at Darkwood Brew, we partake in the ritual known as communion, in which we remember that Jesus, uh, you know, on, the, on a night of betrayal and desertion, when he was just about 33 years old, I mean, imagine that, 33 years old only, he took bread and he said, my friends, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this as often as you eat of it in remembrance of me. And so likewise, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. Yeah. When Jesus said, love your enemies, he was not preaching that to a kind and gentle world. He was preaching into the, it, it to a world in which there were real enemies who were really vicious including enemies who would one day torture him and nail him to a cross. And yet this meal reminds us that Jesus chose that path of peace. Jesus chose that path of love with great intentionality and agency. And one thing that Christians have affirmed for 2,000 years, while people have debated, was he, is he, was he fully God or was he human or what have you, no Christian has ever debated about Jesus' humanity, that Jesus lived into his, the fullest extent of his humanity. And you ask yourself, would Jesus, uh, if he would have chose to hate his enemies a little bit more and gotten out of this death thing, 
lived a little longer, would that have made him more fully human or less? At 33 years old, following that path of loving his enemies, we've looked to Jesus as the most fully human. This meal reminds us that we were once enemies of God, and God chose to love God's enemies. Where will we be? Will we choose to live a bit before we die? We live through sharing this meal and accepting the love from God and loving our enemies in return. If you happen to have bread and wine uh, available to you this, this evening or juice and crackers who would like to join us at home, we always invite you to join us in this most sacred of meals at Darkwood Brew, the bread of life, the cup of blessing.
Thanks for joining us again, uh, Nomaly. And once again, uh, her newest CD, Nomaly Brennett Live, found at nomalybrennett.com. Well, next week, we are very pleased to be joined by a Harvard, Harvard astrophysicist uh, and astronomer named Owen Gingrich. Uh, Owen Gingrich has a book out called uh, God's Universe, a fascinating book of lectures that he delivered at Harvard uh, University. You know, they, uh, Harvard uh, has a very uh, long lecture series in which they almost never invite a Harvard professor to, to speak at. And uh, to my knowledge, he's one of only two professors who has ever been asked to speak at that that series and a fascinating book. Uh, we're going to be asking him about uh, God uh, and God's role in creation. Is there uh, an intelligent designer or intelligent design or, or you know, what's the relationship with all this? Uh, and, uh, what's God's role in, in creation? And he's got some amazing stuff to, uh, to talk to, uh, to us about, about the creation of the cosmos and uh, some of the uh, amazing uh, design perhaps or at least uh, intelligence, perhaps, uh, behind that. But uh, we'll leave the rest for, for next week. Well, if you would like, care to uh, spread the word about Darkwood Brew, we always appreciate that. Uh, getting the word out on Facebook is where we get a lot of our uh, the people who come to know about who we are. So if, if you happen to be a Facebooker, we'd love it if you would uh, spread the word when our programs uh, come on. And please uh, join us next week for Owen Gingrich. Well, now, my friends, until then, may the Spirit, the Spirit of the living God, made known to us most fully in Jesus Christ, our Lord, go before you to show you the way, go above you to watch over you, go behind you to push you into places you may not necessarily go yourself, but may push you on that next stage of your own evolution of consciousness, go beneath you to uphold you and uplift you, Go beside you to be your constant companion and dwell within you to remind you that you are surely not alone. You are loved, loved beyond your wildest imagination. And may the fire of God's blessing burn brightly upon you and within you, now and always. Amen.